Hi, everyone. Welcome to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea. I'm the head of adult programming here. And before I introduce today's guest, I would just like to um, thank a few people. First, I would like to briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much to our friends for making events like these and Buffalo Wings available to the community. I would also like to give a really big thank you to Connor Horgan at Half Full Brewery in Stamford. After the event, we're going to have a reception out in the lobby, and there's going to be free beer courtesy of the brewery. They donated the keg, and Connor's here serving, which is really, really generous of them, and we're very grateful. Um, I also wanted to mention that... You can applaud for <laughs> Yeah! <laughs> They have... Not, not, not you, youngster. The rest of you. <laughs> he was all plotting. Dad, just watch out for him. <laughs> they have an open house at the brewery every Saturday from 1 to 5, and $5 gets you a sampling glass that you get to take home and samples of a number of the different beers. And I've been a bunch of times. It's really fun. So I highly recommend you check them out. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about tonight's guest, which I think is why we're all here. Uh, hopefully not just for free beer. So when I first was going to book this event, my coworker Stephanie, who's right back there, she was like, oh, I think you should do this fantasy sports event. There's this guy who wrote this book on it, and he's kind of really well known in the fantasy sports arena. I don't have the sports part of my brain. <laughs> and I was like, I've never heard of him. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Best <ever. laughs> But so what I did is I emailed both of my brothers. My brothers are huge sports fans. And I was like, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this event with this author. What is good timing for this? And then at the end, I like gave them a link to the book. So I'm actually going to read you what they responded with, because <laughs> I think it's an adequate introduction. Um, so my, my older brother responded first. And he said, I can't speak for Dan. Dan's my other brother. But I play a lot, in caps, of fantasy baseball. Then he really talked a lot about it. One of the leagues I'm in involves the entire minor league system of a team, for instance, and the drafts aren't until spring, say in March. This is because with free agency, trades, et cetera, you don't want to start picking guys until spring training has started, blah, blah, blah. He went on for a while about fantasy <laughs> baseball. And then his next paragraph was, you should also know that Matthew Barry is more or less a fantasy football god. So in the context of inviting him, fantasy football would make a lot more sense. Sorry, everyone. It's not the right timing for that. But then he said, also when you're having, and then he went into all caps, Matthew freaking Barry come to your library. That's what you lead off with in these types of emails. So I can clear the calendar and come. And then this is what my younger brother said. My younger brother's right there. <laughs> he said, holy expletive, Aaron. If you book Matthew Barry, I would flip out. I got goosebumps reading this email. <laughs> I listen to his podcast every single day, Monday through Friday. I know Barry does a lot with both fantasy baseball and football, but is originally a football guy. Also, fantasy football overall is much more popular. So <laughs> that, that's what my brothers had to say. And then I was like, OK, I guess I'm going to book this author, because <laughs> people seem to know about him. Um, but also, what I wanted to say is that every year, over 30 million Americans play fantasy sports. This is more people than play golf, watch American Idol, or visit the Grand Canyon. If fantasy was an actual sport, it would be the fourth most popular sport in the United States. Universally regarded as one of the leading voices on fantasy sports, deemed a fantasy savant by the New York Times, Matthew Barry is ESPN's senior fantasy sports analyst. Also known as the talented Mr. Roto, he has received an Emmy Award for his work on ESPN 2's Fantasy Football Now. He appears regularly on ESPN television and radio shows, including Sunday NFL Countdown, Sports Center, and NFL Live. New York Magazine said about him, at this point, we'd say more sports fans know who Matthew Barry is than know most of the players on their fantasy football team. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Mr. Matthew Barry. <laughs> For the record, I'm here for the free beer. Um, <laughs> a lot of ways that intro could have gone. Like, um, I don't know who he is. And I emailed my brothers. They didn't know who he was. <laughs> but there was this one guy. We had a free Sunday afternoon. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, thrilled to be here. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Uh, 
it's my first, this is the first time I've ever spoken at a library. Um, so, uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, what I thought I'd do is, uh, uh, just real quickly, um, tell you, and if I walk over here, because I like to walk a lot, I'm a walker. There's walkers and there's talkers, apparently. If I walk over here and I'm just like, I don't know. Microphone is now on. <laughs> Been at ESPN for seven years, broadcast professional right here. <laughs> um, um, all right, perfect. So there you go. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a walker. Um, so I thought I would start off by telling you my favorite fantasy story of all time. How many people real quickly have read the book, by the way? All right, so a handful. It's in the book, so don't ruin it for the rest of us. It's in the book, but I think it, it bears repeating. Um, so uh, how many people here watch Fantasy Football Now? Sunday mornings, ESPN2. I'm a company man. Thank you very much. Awesome. So you know my co... Yeah, perfect. Well done. Podcast, podcast fans here as well. Um, uh, so my co-host on the show, Tim Hasselbeck, former NFL quarterback, and of course his brother is Matt, who is still an NFL quarterback right now. He's backing up Andrew Luck in Indianapolis, but for many years he was a starter, he was an all-pro. And when he was the starting quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks in 2009, he also played fantasy football. A lot of people don't realize this, but he actually was in a fantasy football league with his brother Tim and a bunch of guys they went to college with. And in 2009, Matt Hasselbeck selected as his fantasy quarterback, Matt Hasselbeck, <laughs> drafted himself. He also drafted his former real-life teammate, Brett Favre. If you remember, Matt used to play, was the backup to Favre in Green Bay for a number of years. And so he drafted Brett Favre, so those were his two quarterbacks. That year, Brett Favre was, his in, was in his first year as the starting quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. So I don't know if you guys remember, but Favre actually had a monster fantasy season that first year in Minnesota. He was a great fantasy quarterback. And in week five of the 2009 season, Matt Hasselbeck had a decision, himself or Brett Favre. <laughs> he thought about it. He looked at it. Minnesota was playing the Rams. St. Louis was really poor that year. In fact, Matt Hasselbeck himself had lit them up for three touchdowns in the first week of the season. So he knew firsthand how bad the Rams' secondary was. And... Uh, he, in turn, was facing the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jacksonville had won two straight, had a pretty good defense, and Matt himself had been out the previous two weeks with a lower back injury. So in week five of the 2009 season, Matt Hasselbeck decided to bench himself and start Brett Favre. I will save you the trouble of looking it up. Uh, in that particular week, uh, Minnesota got up big. Adrian Peterson had a huge day. And Brett Favre finished with one touchdown pass, one interception, and finished as the 18th best fantasy quarterback in ESPN standard scoring. Meanwhile, Matt Hasselbeck got into a shootout with Jacksonville, threw four touchdown passes, was the highest scoring fantasy quarterback in ESPN scoring that week, sitting on his own bench. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this for a second. Matt Hasselbeck knew the game plan spent all week studying film, knew what they were going to try to do, was calling the plays in the, in, in the huddle. Literally could audible at any time. He's touching the ball on every offensive play. He had as much control over a game as any fantasy owner in the history of the world. And he got it wrong. <laughs> so if Matt Hasselbeck can't get it right, what the hell hope do any of us ever have? I always like to start that off. So as we go into fantasy baseball season, I know it's a football story, but as we go into fantasy baseball season, and there will be times over the course of this upcoming season or next fantasy football season when you start the wrong person, when you drop a player who then suddenly goes off, when you trade for a player who suddenly goes in the tank, when you listen to some jerk on Sunday morning TV who tells you to start somebody who doesn't do anything, There'll be times across the next couple of seasons where you make a decision and you're like, ah, ah. And I want you to remember Matt Hasselbeck, who had more information than you, 
had more control than you and couldn't get it right. Uh, so it's literally my favorite fantasy story of all time. And I've now, Matt, I've now met Matt a couple of times through Tim at various events, what have you. And I, the first time I met him, I'm like, dude, that story. Like, and I, you know, I'm like, yeah, it's my favorite story. It's in my book. I've written about it. When I do the book tours, I, I always start off with that story. And he's just like, it's 100% true. He's just like, and I beat myself. I've like every, I always screw up. He's like, I can never figure out when to start myself. He's like, I never know when. He's like, eventually I get to the point where I'm just starting myself all the time. Like, you know. Um, but it's, uh, it's absolutely my favorite story. What I would like to do, and if anyone here listens to the podcast, seems like we got a lot of podcast fans here. As you guys know, I can talk. I'm a, I'm a talker. I'm a walker and I'm a talker. So I can talk, uh, which I'm happy to do. But I also find at these events, people tend to have a lot of questions. So um, ask me anything you guys want. Ask me stuff about the book. Ask me about fantasy baseball. Ask me about fantasy football. Ask me about ESPN. Ask me about the Darien Library. <laughs> I'll call in Aaron. Because um, in fairness, Aaron, for whatever it's worth, I'd never heard of you either. So it's all. <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a great question. Um, and there is not a lot of uh, consensus on that particular topic, believe it or not. So there is a group of guys, people wonder, like, where, oh, where does talented Mr. Roto come from? Which is sort of my goofy little nickname. And Roto is short for rotisserie, right? And um, in 1979, there was a group of guys uh, that founded what they call Rotisserie League Baseball, a guy named uh, uh, Dan Okrent, who's the former public editor of the New York Times. He's, a, he's an author and an editor, very well known in literary circles. He, uh, he came up with a game that's now basically fantasy baseball, Rotisserie League Baseball, a, a standard four by four, you know, um, catchers and pitchers, out, you know, five outfielders, the whole thing, $260 salary cap, came up with that game as it's known. And uh, so he got a bunch of his friends that are all sort of fairly well-known literary types, uh, you know, editors of the New York Magazine, of Sports Illustrated, and so on and so forth. And they formed this, and they used to have lunch every Thursday at a restaurant lot called La Rotisserie, which is where it came from. So they called themselves La Rotisserie League Baseball. And they were all um, very good writers, and so, and, you know, very literary. And so what happened is, is in 1983, uh, they would start writing about it, and, they, and there started to be some articles about it because there were, you know, um, and then in 1980, yeah, in, in the spring of 83, they published a book. They published a book called Rotisserie League Baseball. And it was a very well-written book. It was very fun and seemed very inviting. And so uh, that's where fantasy baseball first sort of took off. Now, in the uh, 60s, there was a, and I'm going to screw up this name, but there was a bar called King's X in Oakland, California. And they came up with the, like the G-O-P-P-P-L, something like the Greater Oakland Pigskin, Professional Pigskin Pronostication League. That's what it was called. Uh, a guy named um, Bill Wiegenbach and um, uh, a couple of others uh, there, Andy Mussol Mussolimus, um, did a version of what is known as fantasy football. Like they picked players and um, number one draft pick ever, George Blanda. Um, and uh, so they picked players and kept track of how well they did in their real life games. So there's a version of that. Some people consider Stratomatic, which was predated fantasy baseball as the first fantasy baseball. There's a guy named um, uh, Bill Sampson from the University of Minnesota, I believe, who in the 1950s had something called the Baseball Challenge, where people in his classes would pick players and how well they did statistically, like it was like home runs, you know, it was just like sort of home runs and RBIs. So like there's, there's sort of like a lot of debate about that kind of stuff, but most people consider uh, Dan Okrent to be the father, the founding father of fantasy baseball in terms of how it is in the modern times. And, the, and most people consider uh, Andy, Andy Mussolimus and Bill, uh, Bill Wiekenbach in, in Oakland as the sort of creators of fantasy football. So there you go, a boring history lesson to start up the talk off to a good start. The kids, the kids, they love the history. <laughs> we'll, we'll sneak you a free beer. It's fine. All right. <laughs> Next question, my friends. Yes, sir. Uh, first, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is. 
So there you go. She heard I was coming, and she's like, I'm out of here. Like, I'm not sure of the question, to be perfectly honest. No, I mean, like, I'll, I'll answer whichever. So um, this is what I think your question is, and tell me if I'm wrong. I think your question is, there's a lot of stats out there, and there's a lot of different ways to sort of s slice those stats. Um, so when you're doing analysis um, and trying to project the future, is it tough, given, given the limited time you have on a podcast, let alone, like, you know, when I do a sports center hit, it's 45 seconds. I literally have 45 seconds. Um, and even on Fantasy Football Now, which is a two-hour show, I mean, we've, we've got a bunch of reporters, and then we've got Mort coming in, and we've got Stefania doing injuries. I mean, it's like, so you don't have nearly as much time. So my belief is that's what your question is, right? Is that fair? Yeah. I'm curious the difference of how far you can get your analysis versus actually what the value you in terms of Well, there's two different things. I mean, like, in terms of, like, so there's different stats for different things that I value more. Like in terms of, uh, there's different stats that I value uh, more. Um, but in terms of that, yes, it's difficult. So in terms of what I value, and I value them for different things. So, so I may value a certain stat, not because it's a particularly great stat, but because it gets the point across in a short amount of time. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, and this has been sort of a hallmark of my career, what I try to do in the book, what I try to do on the podcast, what I try to do on TV, is I try to be entertaining. Right? Ultimately, it's entertainment. I'm, we're trying to predict the future. You can't do that. So it's literally like, okay, and especially in the podcast, which I think is the best representation of me. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little stiff when, I, when you're on SportsCenter. Like they, they sort of look at you sideways if you get a little too weird. Um, uh, so... You know, I try to just be like, hey, it's fantasy. Like, it's fun. You know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, like, it's fun. We do this for fun. So um, it's definitely tough. It's definitely tough. And so I've sort of taken that approach in terms of, like, so I may value a stat or something because it's a quick shorthand, and you'd be able to get it. You know what I mean? Um, same, in, same as in my writing. You know, one of the favorite articles that I write every year um, is my 100 facts column which I always try to be very, very kind of upfront and open about, which is, for those of you in the audience that haven't ever read it, I basically, I basically make a point of saying, you guys, that stats are lies, that you can manipulate any single stat you want to say whatever you want. That, um, uh, and so I, I, I prove it by, I'll usually, like, I'll take a really good player and I'll just, I'll just dog him. I'll write all these stats about how he has a terrible player and he's obviously like one of the best. Or I'll really talk up a terrible player. Because you can make a stat say anything you want, and pretty much anyone that does any kind of public presentation, whether it's the people on Fox News, whether it's the people on CNN or MSNBC or whichever way you lean, uh, you know, whether it's on ESPN, you know, uh, Fox Sports, whatever, it's people doing pop culture, like pick a topic and I can find it, tell me which way you want me to go and I can find a stat to back my side up. And so I always try to be very open about that. So, um, so I do the research. I'll do really in-depth research that's really boring and that if I, I got on TV or if I wrote four paragraphs about a player, you'd be like, oh, you know what I mean? Because like, I think most fantasy players just, just tell me if he's good or not. That's all I want. Just, do I start him or not? That's all, blah, 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 yards per catch and after contact and air yards and yards per time. Just, which guy? Deshaun, Deshaun Jackson or, or Pierre Garçon? That's all I want to know. Like, like, I literally think that's, like, 90% of, of fantasy players, right? And, I, and when I was starting out in my career, I looked at like a bunch of people that were doing fantasy analysis and I was just like, oh my God, this is so boring. It's like reading a term paper. Like I love fantasy and I want to play, but oh, uh, you know, uh, there's so, only so many times I can read about swinging strike percentage, you know, and you're like, uh. so I just sort of like, my take was like, do all that research. I'll do all, you know what I mean? But like, you don't need to see all the math. I'll tell you Pierre Garcon. You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, 
I'll tell you Brian McCann over Evan Gaddis. Okay, boom. There you go. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need to see like all the, the home run rates and the you know, home run fly ball ratio and where the, where the fences are and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so I mean like my, my goal is always I want people to win, but I also think that ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to entertain. I don't believe, I, I believe the people that listen to our podcast, the people that read me, at least my fan base, that the people listen to me, they want to win, they think my advice is good, but they like me because I present it in an entertaining, fun, digestible way, as opposed to maybe some of the other people. Because there's definitely people that go in there that go much, in much more in depth. And that's just not what I do. I just, I th it's boring to me. So I just think it's, it's no fun. So did that sort of answer your question? Because it was long. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You are my target demo, by the way. It's great to see you here. <laughs> Right. Aaron's mom, ladies and gentlemen. Right there. Yes, ma'am. Are you playing the game on a board or you're playing on a Right. Nah. Nah, it's 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 great to have you here. Um <laughs> It, people say, what will somebody do for a free beer? And um, yeah, no, I, I, think, I think we've made that clear. Um, Ma'am, to, to answer your question very simply, uh, in fantasy sports, what you do is you draft real-life athletes. Okay, You draft real-life athletes to your fantasy team. And how well those athletes perform in their real-life games is how well they perform for your fantasy team. So say you and I were in a league together. And you, you drafted Tom Brady. You've heard of Tom Brady. OK. And I drafted Peyton Manning. You've heard of Peyton Manning. Yeah. OK, great. So on Sunday, let's say Tom Brady throws two touchdown passes, and Peyton Manning only throws one. That's right. I'm <laughs> catering to New England crowd. It's... <laughs> so you would be beating me, in essence, 12 points to six, because six points for a touchdown. Fair? Okay, well, yeah. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so uh, that those are games that exist. They're not what we're talking about. So the games that we're talking about are what I just described to you. They are done on, um, they are done on the computer, oftentimes, or your tablet or your smartphone. We, ESPN.com, for example, you can do it for free. Uh, we'll get you in a league next year. And, um, and, and as part of my job, I appear on television giving advice on how to win these types of games. Excellent. Well, it's good to have you. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Done. <laughs> done and done. Yeah. Brother. Yes. Aaron's brother. It's a great question. And honestly, it'd be football. I will say this. It's not a skill to game. There's more luck, there's more luck involved in it. Uh, shorter, shorter sample size. I mean, just a smaller sample size and everything like that. It's not, it's checkers to chess. Fantasy baseball is chess. I just love fantasy football. Like I just, I, for me right now, like it's part of what my career is like, like the best parts of my job sun, during NFL Sundays. So I get, I get to ESPN probably about 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I go into makeup. And, uh, and then I, I have a meeting with all the people on Fantasy Football Now and we sort of talk about the show. On um, this past year, then I do like a I do a segment on Collins. Uh, Colin Coward has a football show, so I do like a segment there, and then um, uh, then I'll go to uh, you know I'll go grab breakfast. Tim and I usually grab breakfast, and then uh, and then you know about 10 a.m. we start pre-taping some stuff. 
we pre-taped some stuff, a little behind the scenes thing, because during the show, about 11.30, I go to Sunday NFL Countdown. That's the show with Chris Berman and you know, Coach Ditka and, and Tom Jackson, Keyshawn, all those guys, Chris Carter. And so I do a segment with Adam Schefter right when the inactives come out. So I sort of react to the inactives. But I'm gone from Fantasy Bowl now for like, for like close to 45 minutes. So how they do that is we pre-tape some stuff. So like when you see me on the, it's amazing, right, how much I screw up on the, on the, on the touch screen. And we, tape, we pre-tape that. I mean, that's what's amazing. It's like it's not even live. Like, like that's the best version we've got. And so, um, so anyway, so we pre-tape like the flex screen and the, the free agent stuff and that kind of stuff. So they sort of roll that on while I'm on the other show. So it seems, it doesn't look like I'm gone as long as I actually am. And then um, at 1 o'clock, uh, I go into the war room. I'm sure podcast fans have heard me talk about this ad infinitum. But um, like I'm so into that league, obviously, and you're sitting there and you're talking trash with like Mort and Schefter and um, you know Trent Dilfer and Tim Hasselbeck and you know the other guys, and then you know somebody like Chris Berman doesn't play, but he's aware of it. You know, it'll be like you know you'll hear a groan and be like, "Oh, did you have him in fantasy," you know, and he's just like you know, and, and um, you know, so it's just great, and you're just watching football all day with like these legends, with these Hall of Famers, and you're talking fantasy, and it's just like, you know, it's, it's the best part of my job. And so, if I wasn't playing fantasy football, that day's a lot different. And so, uh, that's why. Yes, sir. Let's follow up on his question. If you had to die, yeah. would you prefer fantasy baseball? Because I often hear that from my friends. Like, you know, I don't have the time for fantasy baseball. Yeah, no, I mean, I wouldn't. And the, the answer is, is because time's not my issue, really. I mean, I, it's my job. Um, uh, but, like, you know, I have kids. My kids aren't into baseball. They're into football. Like, I, we, we, I play, I, I wrote about it in the book. You know, I do a little family league with my wife and our kids and their friends and, and their friends' parents. And so, like, and it's been great. We've done it for three years now. And so, you know, I, after that day of watching football, I come home and we all watch the Sunday night game together. And we all watch the Monday night and we watch the Thursday night game together. And we're always talking fantasy and like, oh, you know, I've got him. And it's like, it's great. Like, the kids love it. And, you know, my wife's gotten into it. And so it's like um, that social aspect isn't there with baseball. Even if, I, even if I had a league with the kids, even if the kids were into baseball, it's just not the same because you're just not watching the games. It's not, all, it's not head-to-head, even though there is head-to-head baseball. It's just, it's just not the same. I mean, ba- fantasy baseball is a beautiful game. So is fantasy basketball, actually. So luckily, I don't have to choose, but I want to give an honest answer. Yes, sir. You ended up winning your You know what? I'm all over the place. I like them all. I mean, I actually wish the War Room League was slightly smaller. Um, uh, it's definitely been a different experience. I like 10-team leagues. I like the, you know, I like the 10 and 12-team leagues that we do on ESPN. <laughs> Michael Smith ended up winning the War Room League this year. Um, I should have won. I'm so bitter. I mean, you have no idea. A total bitter berry. I, um, a typical fantasy story. I uh, I lost. At, we do divisions. I finished eight and five, but I was in the same division as Mort, uh, who went um, nine and four. And so uh, I had to. I, I was eligible for one of two wild cards, and I ended up losing out. Schefter got in at six and seven. He won his. He he won his division, which was like the lame division. Um, I was in like the toughest division, and um, uh, I lost out on a tiebreaker of points. Basically, I'm eight and five in a 16-team league, and I didn't make the playoffs on tiebreaker because the guy that beat me in the tiebreaker had Eric Decker, the four-touchdown game. That was the game that I uh, like. I had him on points. I was winning. I was going to be in the playoffs, you know, at eight and five, which I should have been. And uh, you know, Eric Decker has that game. I lose out, and the frustrating thing is I had Jamal Charles, so I would have won the league for a second year in a row had I gotten into the playoffs. Like, I looked at how it all sort of worked out. <coughs> what are you going to do? How, you know, it happens. Giants in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I said Eric Decker that week, by the way. Right. Um, I don't think I... That one wasn't on me. That's on you. Yeah. Like, I, like I, I've, made some, I've made some bad calls. That one wasn't on me. Um, I believe White for auction drafts is checkers. That's checkers to chess as well. Uh, you know, auction drafts are... If we, if we decide we're all going to do a draft here, all of us together, and ma'am, you've got first pick, <laughs> um, 
then I'm going to, uh, you know, if, we, the, if, she, if she gets the first pick and she takes Adrian Peterson, no one, none of us get a shot at Adrian Peterson, right? But in an auction, we all do. It's just a matter of who wants to pay the most. And so for me, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of the same skill as poker. So it's about reading the room and money management and knowing about value and when to pounce and when to not. And like everyone's got the same shot at every player. And so for me, as opposed to like, whatever, last year, Jamal Charles had a monster year, right? Like, uh, if you had pick 10, you chance, chance are you never got a shot at Jamal Charles. Jamal Charles went in the top five of most drafts last year. So, you know what I mean? And like, you could have won without Jamal Charles. I mean, Michael Smith did, right? You know what I mean? Like it, um, but chances are, like, your, your odds of winning without Jamal Charles last year were not nearly as good. You know, so that's, that's why. Yes, sir, in the back. Time out for a second. What do you consider off topic at the moment? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, th these are all, by the way, subjects that are covered in my New York Times bestselling <laughs> book, Fantasy Life, available for purchase outside, which I will sign for you. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a long, it's a very long, no, 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 it's, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out which version to tell you, because there's like a long version, and there's a short version, and there's like a sort of in the between. The very quick version is, because I think probably a lot of the people in the audience have heard this story before. So I've been playing since I was 14 years old. So I'm, not, I'm 44. So this uh, next week, actually, the Fat Dog League, my very first league, will have its 30th auction. So I will have my 30th auction. Um, 30, my 30th year, not my 30th auction. My, it'll be my, the 30-year anniversary of my very first auction, uh, the 30th year of the Fat Dog Fantasy Baseball League. So. Uh, so I've been playing since I was 14 years old, and uh, I was living out in Hollywood. I was a professional screenwriter. I was a comedy writer. And in 1999, there was a website called Roto World, which is a really good fantasy site. And in 99, this is when um, that you know you were dialing up, right? You were like to, you weren't on online all the time. You were like this prodigy, CompuServe, like AOL, right? Uh, you were online maybe once a, uh, once a day. So this website, Roto World, was like, hey, we're looking for fantasy writers. Like, that, that site was just sort of starting up. And I was on that site all the time, and I wrote them. And I said, boy, oh boy, you know, I'm a, I'm a professional writer living out here in Hollywood. Fantasy sports is my passion. I love it. I think it would be so much fun, be so cool, if I could just, you know, if I could just write a column for you guys on the side. You know, can I try out? Could I do a sample? Something like that. So they wrote me back the next day, and they said, we looked you up on IMDb. Married with Children is our favorite show of all time. You're hired. So that's how I became a fantasy expert. Uh, my, I think I'm a pretty good writer. And the column quickly took off. People seemed to like my advice. They kept coming back. And so uh, I started doing some radio uh, for Roto World. In 2004, I, and my nickname was Talented Mr. Roto. Again, Roto, short for rotisserie. Off the movie, Talented Mr. Ripley. The whole thing about the name. But, um, uh, basically, in 2004, I felt like I developed enough of a following, and people were starting to make money on the internet at that time. Not a ton of money, I mean, but you know, people had started, at least in my world, in the, in the fantasy sports business. There had been a couple of fantasy sports sites that had started up and looked like they were making money. And so I thought to myself, hey, maybe I'll go do this. This will be fun. So in, uh, in 2004, uh, I left to start my own site, TalentedMrRoto.com, like worst URL in history. And I'd constantly be on the radio, like, TalentedMrRoto.com, M-R-R-O-T-O. It's two R's, like a horrible URL, but um, probably why it was available. And uh, anyway, so, uh, so I did that. And I basically, I was still making my living as a screenwriter. I was writing for movies and, and TV at that time. And I said, I basically went to every website I could find, every radio station I could find, every television station I could find, 